Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the house of the Lord on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning. May the Lord bless you. We welcome every one of you, members and visitors alike. And you out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up, we kind of an inspiration to every one of you. If you get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in. We'll try to be a blessing to them. Now, I want you to take your Bibles today and turn to the book of Acts chapter 1. We appreciate your presence today on this Easter Sunday morning. Many of you are dressed up in your beautiful Easter dresses and whatnot. You look real pretty out there in the audience. I'm kind of reminded of the old drunk man and a real ugly man got in an argument. The old drunk man said to the ugly man, said, you're ugly. The ugly man said, you're drunk. He said, you're ugly. He said, you're drunk. He said, you're ugly. He said, you're drunk, but I'll be over mine tomorrow, said the drunk man. Now, Acts chapter 1 for the reading of God's word today. Page 1147. Turn there, will you please? Today's cassette tape will be number 172. We'll send this tape out to you in appreciation for a gift of $3 to help keep the program on the air. And these that I shall mention, I do have a list of about 170 by cassette tapes available. We'd glad to send you a list. You write in today, requested by number or by title, or request a list of our cassette tape. We'd be glad to send them to you. I do, do have a few of our beautiful Bible markers left we brought back from the Holy Land just a week or so ago, just a few of them. And if you'd like to have one of our beautiful Bible markers, has a picture of scenes in the Holy Land on one side and a beautiful flower seen on the other, just send in a gift and I'll send you the, uh, the Bible mark in appreciation for your support to this ministry. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, Post Office Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you're tuned into this station where you're now listening at 12 o'clock noon, that is Monday through Saturday, you can get the daily broadcast. Now in Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, page 1147, the former treaty have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, I'm just reading those three verses. I'll be giving you other verses. But notice he said that he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. I want to speak to you today on the infallible proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These cannot be denied. Just a few weeks ago, one of our guests in our group asked the guide. The guide was a Muslim belonged to the Islamic religion. They believed in Mohammedan, and Mohammedan is dead. His body was buried over in uh, Mecca. And so uh, he asked him, said, uh, uh, is Mohammedan alive or is he dead? And the guide said, he's dead forevermore. Well, our God is not dead. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. Christianity is the only religion in the world today that's a live religion. All other religions are absolutely dead. Those that follow Confucius, Mohammedan, uh, any of the other false prophets that rose up and led millions astray, Buddha or whatnot, they're all dead. Their leaders are dead and no doubt in hell. But Jesus Christ today is alive and in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. And we're serving a live God and we have a live religion, or if you want to call it that. And Jesus Christ came back from the grave after having spent three days and three nights 
in the grave. Jesus spent exactly 72 hours in the grave. Now you may say, Preacher Edwards, how could he have been crucified on Friday and come out on Sunday morning and have spent 72 hours in the grave? He was not crucified on Friday. People did not start teaching that until about the 4th century. That's the rags of Rome. Jesus Christ was not crucified on Friday. All this Good Friday false doctrine today is not of God. It's made up by the filthy rags of Rome in the 4th century. And it's not true to the Bible. When you preach or teach that Jesus Christ was crucified on Friday, then you're teaching and preaching error. And that's being taught by and preached by multitudes all over the world that Jesus was crucified on Friday and came out of the grave on Sunday morning. That is not true. Jesus Christ was crucified on Wednesday. Jesus came out of the tomb at 6 o'clock on Saturday at the end of the Jewish Sabbath, which was on Saturday. And when they came to check on him, he had risen already. He came out at 6. They came later on in the night, early part of the morning, to check on the grave, the tomb, but he was not there. Now you may say, Preach Edwards, doesn't the Bible say after he was crucified, the next day was a Sabbath? That's exactly right. But what a lot of people don't know is that's more than a weekly Sabbath in the Bible. It so happened at that particular time there were three Sabbaths in succession. Thursday was a high day. That was a Sabbath day. Friday was also a Sabbath day. And Saturday was a Sabbath day. And so Jesus was placed in the grave be crucified the day before the high day, which was on Thursday, which was the an annual Sabbath for the Jews in those days. And a lot of people thought, well, they're talking about a weekly Sabbath, and that's why they teach he was crucified on Friday. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 that as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Jesus said, that is the great sign you're asking for. And his body lay in Joseph's new tomb, 72 hours, three days, and three nights, exactly like he said. Now, if Jesus was crucified on Friday, how could you get three days and three nights if he was crucified on Friday and came out on Sunday morning? You could not. You couldn't get any more than two nights. You could not get uh, three full days. So we must stand with the Scripture. Let God be true in every man alive. Jesus Christ was crucified on Wednesday. If you will trace the steps of Jesus day by day, beginning six days before his crucifixion, you will find that he was crucified on Wednesday. Those that teach he was crucified on Friday have a real problem because there's some things happening in there on Thursday they, they can't figure out. The reason they can't figure it out is because they're wrong on teaching the day he was crucified. So Jesus was crucified on Wednesday and placed in the tomb at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening and stayed there until 6 o'clock on Saturday and came out at the end of the weekly Sabbath on Saturday evening at 6 o'clock and then the first day of the week began at 6 on, Wednesday, on, on Saturday evening. Now you keep that in mind. I want to mention some of the proofs of his resurrection Proof without a shadow of doubt. Now the resurrection is mentioned 40 times in the New Testament. Keep that in mind. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is mentioned 40 times in the New Testament. Number one, we have the testimony of prophecy in the Word of God. I'm giving you some infallible proofs of His resurrection. In Job chapter 19 verses 25 and 26, Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin a worm destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now here we have Job talking about in his flesh seeing God. Now what does he have reference to? He has reference to the resurrection. Job is talking here about the resurrection. The book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And he's talking about the resurrection of the body. You have that in the book of Job, that is prophecy. In the book of Psalms chapter 16 and verse 10, he said, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. 
There you have a verse of scripture pertaining to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his body not seeing corruption. Had Jesus Christ remained in the grave and not come out, his body would have seen corruption, but he came out. It came out of that grave after 72 hours. Psalms chapter 16 and verse 10. Another verse in prophecy, Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 19. Isaiah said, Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awaken, saying, Ye that shall dwell in the dust, for the day is as the dew is as the dew of their herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. There you have Isaiah the prophet talking about the resurrection. He said the earth will cast out the dead. That's going to happen. Whenever Jesus comes, the earth will belch out all the bodies of all our loved ones that's resting in the cemeteries. At the end of the millennium, the earth will kick out all the dead bodies of those who are in the grave that died without God. Mother Earth cannot hold these bodies forever. She's got to belch them up. They must come out, and they will. The saints of God first, a thousand years later, at the unsaved. Then we move to testimony number two, and that's a testimony of Jesus' prophetic statements, the ones he made himself. Now listen to them. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So Jesus prophesied while he was on the earth that he would be raised again the third day. That is the end of the third day, which is 6 o'clock on Saturday. That's what he's talking about. Raised again, he said he would be. In John chapter 2 and verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, talking about his body. Destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it up. In verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. Jesus said, Destroy this body, crucify me. Put me to death. But he said, after three days, not one day and a half, not two days, after three days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I will raise this body up again. That's exactly what he did. He raised that body. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, you need to underscore this verse of Scripture. Jesus gave the sign. They said, we want a sign. Jesus said, this is the only sign I'm going to give you, and this is the sign. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's as plain as your nose on your face. You cannot change that. You cannot have Jesus Christ crucified on Good Friday so-called and raised on Sunday morning. You can't do it. It doesn't fit in the Word of God. You must believe what God said. Jesus said this. Jesus said to those people, I'm giving you one firm sign. And this is the sign. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, I'll be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And that was the greatest sign that he gave those people in his day. That's exactly what happened. We move to testimony in number three. And that's a testimony of the empty tomb. Just a few weeks ago, for the twelfth uh, time, I walked into that empty tomb. I looked over to my right where my Lord lay. There were people weeping in that tomb. There were people weeping on the outside of that tomb. We looked. We couldn't find our Lord. He wasn't there. He's not here. The Bible said he is risen. We found only an empty tomb. And that tomb is still empty. Now when General Abelic, uh, Abelic crossed over uh, the uh, Jordan River and conquered Jerusalem in World War II, there the Turks who was in charge of Jerusalem at that time, they went to the tomb and everything that they had stored in there that was precious, they moved out all their treasure. But beloved, the treasure was moved out about 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus Christ came out. And that was an empty tomb. In Luke chapter 24, in the first three verses, the Bible said upon the first day of the week, that's Sunday morning, real early, even before day, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. 
Now they had rolled a huge stone over the mouth of that grave. It shows the groove in front of the tomb where the stone fit right into that tomb. A huge stone. Man could not move. It took several men to move it. Now they moved the stone out of the way and went in. And lo and behold, there was nothing in that tomb. That body was gone. No body in there. Only the grave clothes. And they went in and they found the empty tomb. And from that time until now, it's been empty. That tomb belonged to Joseph Amos, the earth's secret disciple that was a very, a very rich man. And he had hewn that tomb out of a rock, a solid rock. The poor people buried their loved ones in caves. Rich people uh, hewed their graves out of solid rocks. And they walked into the grave in those days, not down into the ground. We walked into them. And so he hewn this uh, uh, grave out of a solid rock. Joseph did and was saving it for himself and his family. But when Jesus was crucified, he was a secret disciple. And he went to Pilate and said, would you let me have the body of Jesus and place him in my tomb? Pilate said, yes, go take the body down. They want to get it down before sundown. That was the Jewish law. And he took that body down and put it in his brand new tomb. While no man had lain. There he placed the body in there. But that tomb was empty after 72 hours. And then we come to testimony number four. And that's the testimony of the rolled up grave clothes. That's one of the infallible proofs. I'm talking about infallible proofs, unerring truths, truths you can depend upon. They found the grave clothes still in the tomb, but there's no body in it. And the grave clothes were like they were all except the napkin that went around his face. That was taken and laid aside, but the other linen cloth, they were still wrapped just like a human being on the inside of them, but nothing in there. Now, Jesus didn't have to unwrap those uh, uh, claws from around his body, those linen claws. He just came out and left them wrapped just like he was in them. And when they went in, they found nothing but the clothes. It did not have a body in it. Now, if that had been an ordinary human being coming out, of, he'd have had to torn those clothes, those linen claws, unwrapped them, and he'd have had them all twisted up and piled up in a pile, but not the Son of God. Those clothes were lying there just exactly like he was in them, but he was not in them. That's one of the proofs. In John chapter 20, verses 6 through 8, the Bible said, Then come his Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. The other disciple was none other than John. Now he came to the tomb and stopped on the outside and peeped in. No Simon Peter being impulsive. Well, he didn't stop. He just ran right on into that tomb. And he and John went in there and they saw the clothes and the napkin on one side, but no body in there. Jesus had come out of those clothes and left his grave clothes. That's a great infallible proof of his resurrection. Did not disturb those grave clothes, only the napkin that went around his face the way they wrapped people in those days. Then we come to testimony number five. And that's a testimony of the appearance of Jesus himself after his resurrection. Did you know Jesus never appeared to one lost person? Did you know no unsaved person ever saw the body of Jesus after he was buried? Not a one. When Jesus came out of that grave... In a glorified body, he did not appear to the first unsaved person. He only appeared to save people after his resurrection. That's not without great significance. You must remember that. Now let's see to whom he appeared. Number one, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary Magdalene was a woman out of whom the Bible said Jesus cast seven demons and she loved the Lord with all her heart. Last night I turned on the TV and they had one of these old religious programs on that they film in Hollywood and they were talking about how Jesus appointed four of his apostles and Jesus and the four apostles and Mary Magdalene all stayed in one house together implying that she was shacking up there with the apostles and Jesus alive the devil the Bible doesn't say anything about that you better be aware of these stinking religious films that they show on TV that's made by the harlots and the gamblers and the drunks in Hollywood they know nothing about the word of God and they butcher up the Bible. I saw in the paper where they're going to show a, a movie 
of uh, Bathsheba's lover, David the giant killer. That'll be right out of pit of hell itself. That film's made by the drunks and the harlots and the dope addicts and the crooks and the gamblers and dominated by Roman Catholicism out of Hollywood. All of these films you see on TV, and they showed quite a few last week, made in Hollywood by the drunks and the harlots and the gamblers and the dope addicts and the crooks and the go devils and all the rest of them. You better beware of those films. They're not true to the Bible. They'll touch on the Bible in different places, just like I mentioned a moment ago where he made the statement that Mary Magdalene and four of the apostles and Jesus lived in a house together down there in Capernaum. A lie of the devil. And he said Mary Magdalene was a harlot. The Bible doesn't say she was a harlot. And so they take those things and try to make it appeal to carnal minds and unsaved, uh, wicked people and butch up the word of God and they stink to high heaven and they're dom dominated by the rags of Rome and made by crooks and harlots and gamblers. And don't you put any confidence in any of those religious films that's shown on TV are uh, made in Hollywood by the unsaved. They don't know anything about the Word of God. No, they know nothing about the Bible and care nothing about it. They make those films to make money and to see poor people and people look at it and they only touch on the scriptures along as they want to and to see people. I wouldn't waste my time. I wouldn't waste my time looking at some of those things. If you want to find out something about it, read the Bible and get it firsthand from the Word of God. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. She was demon-possessed. He cast them out. And she loved the Lord with all of her heart. She was the first one to the tomb. She was the first one to go to that tomb to see if Jesus was still there to anoint his body. And she loved the Lord. And then he appeared to a group of women after that. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 9, as they went to Tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, said, All hell. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Here we find a group of women. And those women came back to the cross after he was crucified. And they came back to the tomb after his burial. They loved the Lord. They stood by him right to the end. And so they came back to, to anoint his body afresh and anew on this particular day. And he met them. He was alive. He had come out of the grave. Then he appeared to Simon Peter. The Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verse 34, the Lord is risen indeed and had appeared to Peter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, that is Simon Peter. Now, why did Jesus appear personally to Simon Peter? No doubt the answer is because Simon Peter had denied him, and he went out and wept bitterly, and it broke his heart. And Simon Peter was crushed to the heart, and he had a broken and bleeding heart, and he couldn't get over the fact he had denied the Lord and he had such broken heart until Jesus went to him personally, no doubt, and said, Simon, I'm alive. I'm alive forevermore. And there soothed that broken heart of Simon. And then he appeared to two on the road to Emmaus. If you read Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 27, you'll find that Cleophas and another person walked along the highway. And they began to talk about what had happened in Jerusalem, about his crucifixion, about his burial. And they said, well, he said he'd be on the grave in three days after three days. All of a sudden, a man joined them. Yeah. said, what are you fellas talking about? Well, they said, haven't you heard about they crucified Jesus of Nazareth and, and uh, so forth and so on? And he walked along with them. And then he said, uh, uh, he began to quote the scriptures over in the Old Testament to prove that Jesus must be crucified, number one, and he must rise again, number two. And he gave them the word of God. And later on, when he revealed himself to them, while they said, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us and opened up the word of God, by the way? He gave them the scriptures. He appeared to them. And then he appeared to all the disciples except Thomas. Now, Thomas wasn't there. I don't know whether he had to go to the beach that day or the mountains or go over to Aunt Anne's to a birthday dinner or a family reunion. But anyway, he had missed out that day. And the Bible says in John 20, verse 19 and 20, and the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus to the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, his hands where he had been wounded, his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Now they, Thomas was absent. I guess maybe he had gone east egg hunting or something. But anyway, he was absent. And he wasn't there. He had to go visit somebody 
pray maybe they lived across town and want to pay them. He just wasn't there. Thomas just wasn't there that day. And when you miss out in the church service on Sunday, you miss something. Now, Thomas missed seeing the Lord because he was absent in church that Sunday. So he appeared to disciples. And then the Bible tells us that he appeared to two Thomas and disciples later. In John chapter 20 and verse 26, after eight days again, his disciples were then, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now when Thomas heard what he missed by not being in church the Sunday before, brother, he didn't miss this Sunday. He was right there, and Jesus came and appeared to them. Didn't even open the door, just came in right through the door and appeared in the midst. And he appeared to the disciples and Thomas. Of course, Thomas still kind of doubted. And Jesus said, Thomas, do you still doubt that I'm the crucified Savior, risen Savior? I want you to put your hand here in my side. Look at these scars in my hand. Put your hand in my side. Thomas reached out and touched the side of Jesus where that soldier had penetrated his side with a spear. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He didn't doubt anymore. There he saw the signs. And then Jesus appeared to seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee. In John chapter 21 and verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. And then he appeared to 500 of his children at one time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren, saved people, if you please, at once. After that he was seen of James. He was seen of Paul even after his ascension back to heaven. Uh, Paul saw him. John saw him again on the Isle of Patmos. Since the day of Paul and John, nobody else has ever seen the Lord Jesus Christ. He's never appeared to anyone in person. All these cults today and false leaders that tell you Jesus appeared to them in person and angels came and talked to him. It's a lie of the devil. Jesus Christ has not appeared to anyone since then. And they tell you that to establish a cult and to uh, prey upon poor gullible people to get money out of people. And they tell you a bald-faced liar. Don't you believe a word of it. And then we have the testimony of his enemies. His enemies had to testify that something had happened. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 12 through 15, And when they were assembled with the elders, and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this sin is commonly reported among the Jews today. Even the Jews today will tell you they came and stole his body. Now they paid those soldiers to say that. The religious leaders paid them money to say that they had stole his body. Which is a lie and that lie is still common among the Jews today. Finally, you have the testimony, the facts of the resurrection on our own lives today. The very fact you're sitting there saved proved that Jesus came out of the grave. Watch the scripture. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You cannot be saved denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. You cannot be saved denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You must believe it. Romans 10 and verse 9. I like to give this illustration. I've heard it many times, but it's so fitting. About this man going down the rough, rugged road, crooked, sandy, rough, ditches on either side, coming near cemetery. There's a man standing by. He said, could you tell me how to get to a certain home of a dear man? I'm trying to find where he dwells. He said, yes, sir. He said, you go on down this road and you go through a cemetery and just beyond the cemetery is a big white mansion. That's where he dwells. How true that is. You're traveling down life's highway today. If Jesus tears his coming, you're going through the cemetery. But on the other side, there's a wonderful place for you there in heaven after you get through the cemetery. Some of you may never get to go to the cemetery. You may go out at the rapture. There's a little bird one time laid some beautiful eggs out in a little bush nearby. A little girl would go out and check them every day. On Easter morning, she went out and lo and behold, uh, nothing but little shells there. And a mother talked to her, told her about the resurrection of Jesus. And she saw those shells and she said, Well, the little birds have been resurrected. There's nothing here but the shells. Oh, beloved, one of these days, God's going to call his people out. 
Many years ago, young in Michigan, there was a little girl that died. They brought a little body into the church and they placed a little bouquet in her hands. And there was a little bud that never bloomed. There was a little rose of Sharon, a little bud there. And they finished the funeral and then they came down to view the body for the last time. And during the funeral, that little bud had burst forth in a beautiful flower, a rose of Sharon. And when the loved ones came, they saw what had happened. They were thrilled to their heart. They said, our little one has burst forth in the rose of Sharon. She's not here. She's in heaven. She's budded. She's on the other side. We all have loved ones on the other side. We look forward to seeing them. They're in a better world than we are. One of these days, Jesus will come and we'll see them again. God bless you. You've listened well. Stand to your feet. Dear Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. We thank you for the resurrection of our dear Lord. We thank you we have a God that's alive forevermore. We thank you for the hope of seeing our loved ones again in heaven. We thank you, our Father, for salvation today. And I pray that you'll speak to every heart in this building and those in the radio listening audience. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. As Debbie plays for us, listen to me just a moment and we'll be going. If you're in this building unsaved, are you backslidden on God? Are uh, you want to join this church and we receive members? Are uh, you want to come forward for any reason here at this altar? I want you to come while Debbie plays. We'll give you ample time to respond. Would you come? If God is speaking to you now, would you come? If you want North Side to be your church home, or if you're not saved, you want to get saved, you can't go to heaven if you die without God. Hell will be your destination. And you have no lease on life and no promise of tomorrow. It pays to be ready. Would you come if God is speaking? If you're backslidden on the Lord, would you come back to God while we wait? Would you come? <laughs>